Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with step by step repair guides, high quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll ever need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twig and enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout. And by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,000 high-quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash knowhow. In this episode of Know How, you're going to learn how to prepare your rig for Titanfall. We're upgrading a PC with some SSDs and some memory. Then we're going to get all the swiggy with monitoring your bandwidth usage. What do I do with myself? <laughs> Welcome to Know How. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, and this is the show where we build, break, upgrade, and turn into awesomeness. I'm the digital Ge Jesuit, joined by... Brian Burnett. Yeah, Cranky Hippo in the chat room. We're here to give you the knowledge to break down projects like the stuff you see in front of us and turn it into something that you can use in your geek life. Yes. Brian, I see you're... You keep fondling that thing. Uh, well, I had a good time playing with it the last couple of days. I, I noticed that, but uh, you know what? Uh, before we talk about that Titanfall, how about a public service announcement for the good folks at home? Sure. Okay, well, have you ever heard of a hackathon? I have heard of a hackathon. Yeah, it's a gathering of geeks, like-minded individuals who do media, tech, hardware, software, pretty much everything, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, the definition of a hacker has changed over the years. Do you remember what it used to be? I mean, way back when you were like a kid back yeah, in Yeah, like, it used to be those people 2000. in a dark room with monitors all over the wall, and then you just like code going over the monitors. And... <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what a lot of people think a hacker is. But now we understand that the hacker, the hacker culture, mm -hmm. is all about taking things and maybe using them in a way other than their intended purpose. And, and that really, that's, that's the mother of invention, right? right? Right, Yeah, because you take something that you have and you, you play with it. You, you tease the usefulness out of the device and you come up with something new. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's why we're talking about a hackathon that's going to be taking place in Irvine. I believe uh, Alex has, uh, so there we go, the OC Hackers Hacking for Good. Now, uh, this was put on by uh, a man by the name of uh, Anil Patini, Pat Patini, I don't know his name, but all I know is he's been a hacker for about 15 years, and he wanted to build something that could be an incubator for anyone who was interested in any part of the hacker culture. So the idea is, if, if you know how to do hardware hacking, if you mm -hmm. know how to do software hacking, if you are a media person, an artist, a creative person, and you want to come, look at a bunch of projects, look at a bunch of different demos, listen to a couple of pitches, maybe meet up with people who you can join and create something, then we'll match you up with business people who could maybe monetize that and turn it into something that you Wow, that sounds that pretty cool. Yeah. Because it's more of a mesh. It's not just software stuff. It's, it's hardware and and software coming together. It's the maker and hacker kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're seeing more and more of that where software alone, that's kind of cool. Hardware alone, that's kind of cool. But when you put the two together, along with people who actually have vision, who actually have style, who can actually make something that people want to use, that's when you get something magical. I mean, I can think of one company right now in the Bay Area who's famous for that, that? Apple, right? Uh -oh. You don't think of hardware, software, design. It's all one product. That's what the people at a hackathon want to do. Yeah, something that you can do in your garage, maybe? Yeah. Start, start mm. there? Mm. Uh -huh. okay. Well, the event's going to be um, the 22nd to the 23rd of March down in Irvine. It's actually going to start off with a tour of the SpaceX headquarters, and you're going to see some of the builds, which is, which is cool. kind of nice because, I mean, that's, that's also, that's hacker mentality, yeah, right? Yeah. Take, take something and turn it into something like a spacecraft. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, if you are in Irvine, and if you are interested in finding out how this hacker community works, why not go ahead and join them? Uh, the link for the Eventbrite event page is going to be in our show notes 
make sure to, to check them out. Okay. Is there tickets that you have to purchase or something? Uh, yeah, there's some, some tickets, but just go to the Eventbrite page and it'll spell it all out. I mean, it's right. it's really not that much. What this what this guy is trying to do more than anything else is invigorate the community down south yeah, in Southern California. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very and, cool. and, and we're all about that. That's what we do. Yeah, that's why we have a G plus community. That's Thank why you. we have a G plus community. And uh, you know what that G plus community has been watching the last couple of late nights? No idea. Really? <laughs> Is it True Detective? No, no, no it's not True Detective. <laughs> it's been us on this machine here. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah we've, been, we've been playing this game called Titanfall. Uh, Brian, can you explain what Titanfall is? Uh, well, it's, if you ever played Call of Duty, it's that with robots. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah, in it's fact, I, I think Alex has got some video he's going to play underneath us right here. It's, it's going to show what Titan fall video play looks like I, I it's like a mix between call of duty and uh oh yeah here, here we go there and actually go. if you could uh, make that full screen go ahead and put it on the full screen so that people can see the amazing detail that's involved in this game now this was a match you were doing last night and by the way all of your matches look like this right you were just dominating the oh field. yeah consistently, consistently at the top of the list yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it feels like your your old call of duty shooter right i mean it's the same layout it's the same keys right uh, but the the eye candy is great the the detail to the game is actually really really nice and um and then it, the cool thing is is that you don't have to have crazy hardware to play this on full right. specs and it still looks pretty good right like uh, like for example there's, there's there's some people in the uh, chat room like harlequin who's saying oh this reminds me more of crisis well crisis was famous for taxing that's your still hardware an internet death. joke too it, it's it is like, like oh nothing. i have this great pc i built but well, does it run crisis <laughs> nothing will run crisis at full uh, eye candy it won't <laughs> but this is running on the 10 year old source engine Right. right, the same thing that Half-Life 2, uh, Counter-Strike, Source, uh, Portal. Team Fortress, yeah. Portal. Yeah. 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 They all run on that engine, and that, that hardware is abundant. Now, we thought that maybe we'd want to show you a few things that you could do, a, a few things that you might consider in upgrading your current PC in order to get up to uh, what we'd call acceptable levels. Now, I know that at home, you were running on an older PC, correct? Right. At home, I have about, it's a four-year-old computer. I've got eight gigs of RAM, um, a six-core AMD processor, but I have a 6800 series ATI card. So it's decent, but I had to run things at, some things at medium and no anti-aliasing. Uh, right, right, right. So, so the game runs, it runs smoothly, but yeah. you don't get all the eye candy. Right. right. Which is, now this box right here, this is an Acer Predator. We're going to be doing this box on before you buy. This is one of their gaming machines. It's a dedicated gaming machine. And it's a different kind of gaming machine. It's designed for those people who really don't want to mess around with the box. You want to buy it, you want to play. Plug and it in and probably never really upgrade. It doesn't make much noise either. It, no, like it's the whole time we were playing quiet. it, it was just. Yeah, I mean, like anything. I bet your gaming PC is probably under the desk, right? <laughs> it is, yeah. Because if it's next to you, it's hard to get into the game when all you hear is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, this was designed to be quiet. Uh, we actually had this on the desk while we were playing. It didn't interfere with gameplay at all. Now, this is it's a relatively high-end PC. You've got a, a Intel i7, high-end i7 quad-core CPU. You've got eight gigabytes of memory expandable to 32. You've only got a one terabyte spinning hard drive, but you've also right. got a SSD cache module, which speeds it up. But you've also got that uh, GTX 770. Yeah, card. now that's a pretty good card right there. Yeah, and, and go ahead and run the video in the back here. You can see that we've got all the eye candy on. We actually turned on full anti-aliasing, right? You, you maxed that thing oh, out. Oh, yeah. The, the only thing we didn't have maxed out was the um, ultra-high texture resolution, which they recommend having a 3 gigabyte video card or above. Which right, right. This doesn't have, so we didn't try that. Yeah, exactly. But everything's and, and, maxed out. Yeah, the textures are different just because they have to be loaded in memory. You right. don't want to be swapping that out during gameplay. So, yeah, you know, you do want that video card with three, four gigabytes of, of memory. But we thought we might show you a few things that you could do to your current PC to uh, give you a better chance of having that smooth Titanfall drop. Now, you know what this is, right? That's an SSD. Yeah, this is an SSD. This is a Kingston SSD. Back in episode, what was that? Uh, like 64, 63? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, sorry, 67. 67? Back, back right. in episode 67 of Know How, we actually talked about when, when Ayaz was still with us, how you choose an SSD. Specifically, you look at capacity and price point, format, speed, reliability, and speed over time. 
Personally, I've always gone with the higher-end Kingston. I specifically like their KC series just because they, they are affordable. They, uh, they actually measure really well when you compare them to other dryers from Samsung and Intel. And they last. I, that's the thing I want. I don't want to buy a screaming fast SSD mm -hmm. that's going to become slow after six months because of the way that it's designed. This thing will keep 95% of its speed to its last write, which I like. And the main reason that you'd want an SSD for a gaming rig is loading? Loading stuff quickly? Yeah, yeah. Now, we noticed because this has a rotating drive, mm -hmm. but once it was loaded up, it actually ran really smoothly, right? Right, and that's because the source engine does really good offloading of of, uh, of data, reloading of data mm -hmm. in times that you don't need to to be doing that that sort right. of loading, right? Well, if you've got an SSD, it's not going to help with that part of the game, but what it will help is with the loading up of a level. level. You'll so see if we're playing Crisis, so much the maps will load way quicker. <laughs> the maps will mo load up within. And a from day. my experience, it's like once you go SSD, you can't go back. You really can't. Yeah, it's Ugh. it's one of those things that people are like. Oh, I guess it's kind of faster, <laughs> but when you when you've been playing on an SSD and you go back or waiting for your OS to load up, too. Ah, it's just so. it's torturous. Now, I will say this: these still aren't that big. I mean, they've got the 500 gigabyte versions now, but that's when it jumps up in price. It right? kind of jumps up in price. Really, 240, 250 is still kind of the sweet spot. You can get that for close to 100 bucks now. But, but uh, Titanfall is a big game. It's 50 gigabytes, and that's yeah. that's the compressed files. <laughs> they, how many hours did you spend working on downloading that? A long time. Here yeah. in the brick house, we've got a, we've got like 100 megabits per second, and it, it just, just took it forever. Took like five hours. It was it was not great. But um, if you're gonna do the SSD route. Just know how big this game is and know how big your other games might be, mm -hmm. so you might need multiple SSDs. And offload some of those video, music, and photos that you have and right, stuff like that. Right. Uh, so if we have an older rig and we up, uh, upgrade the SSD, so what should we do, power supply and video card? Uh, yeah, you know, this, this we're going to cover in an, a later episode of Know How, because I want to dedicate something specifically on how to choose the graphics card you're going to upgrade, mm -hmm. and how you choose the power supply that you're going to need. Now, the reason why you need to think of this as a pair is because if you've, especially if you've got an older machine, your power supply is probably not going to be able to handle the power requirements of a newer graphics card. These things just suck power. I mean, I, I believe the, the high-level one right now, there's a, there's a GTX card that pulls like 300 watts. Huh. Yeah, exactly. Which is why you need these these supplemental power. If you go to the overhead, you, they, these cards have these supplemental power sockets so that you could jack in straight from the uh, from the power supply rather than going through the motherboard. That's one of the ways that they they keep the traces on a motherboard from mm -hmm. becoming too unwieldy. But uh, but we again we don't want to talk about this right now, right? Okay. Yeah. Because, we'll, wait, because we'll save that. With Titanfall, since it's using the source engine, if you've I'd say on the ATA, ATI side, if you've got a, 6000 series and above should or okay. on the uh, on the Nvidia side if you've got a 600 series or above you should be fine right yeah. and this is it's a really fast paced game so you're going to want the the 60 frames per second cuz uh I don't know about you, Padre, but I was getting killed a lot on my home PC until I turned down the graphics. I was like, oh, things are smooth now. Yeah. You know, the sad part is I was getting killed a lot, and then I turned <laughs> down the graphics, and, and it's I kept was happening. still getting killed oh. a lot. But you still felt like a badass, right? Hopping out of mechs. And... I felt very flat. Oh. I got stepped on three times. <laughs> At least it looked pretty. <laughs> I have not, I, I have to, you have to teach me how you do that thing where you uh. jump on top of an enemy. Titan. Well, yeah. I, I can't. can't let all my secrets out. Uh, yeah. All right, but okay, how about this? Hmm. Why don't we show them the easiest way to get a, a little bit of an extra speed boost out of their existing system? All right. And it's simply this. It's memory. Ooh. Yeah? Yeah, you know these yeah, things? That looks yeah, looks familiar. Okay, now here's the thing about memory. Everything runs faster with memory. Windows is going to run faster. I don't, Mac OS X is going to run faster. Your game will definitely load faster. It will run faster if it doesn't have to swap out to the hard drive all that much. If you're going to be running Titanfall, I would recommend a minimum of 8 gigabytes, preferably 16 or 32. Now, choosing memory is a lot like choosing an SSD in that everyone's going to have their own favorite. They're going to have the brand that they like. But, but here's the only thing I want to offer. If you are going to buy memory, please don't just buy it off of Amazon. 
because there's so many types of memory you can get. People get the DDR level wrong, DDR3, now DDR4. People get the speed wrong. And, and even if you get everything exactly right, some of these systems just don't like being fitted with generic memory. Have you, have you ever seen that? Oh, I've seen that. I, but I always pick the, the RAM that has the pretty heat sink on it. You know, <laughs> that means it's good, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, but one thing when I was building my first PA, you def my first PC, uh, you definitely want to look through the motherboard manual because there was a list of RAM that worked and didn't work. Exactly. Yeah, the motherboard uh, manual is a really good place. That's a it's a reference spot. That's if you're starting from scratch. That's you know, if you're starting from scratch. PC. But there's actually another way. There's a, a decent way to figure out. And uh, if you could go ahead and go to my uh, my main computer, I'm, I'm going to show you that there are a couple of country companies like Crucial and Kingston. Uh, again, these are my two favorite companies to get memory from. They have memory selectors. What they'll let you do is you can go in here and you can choose system-specific memory and tell it, well, am I, am I doing a server? Am I doing a, a desktop, a laptop? You can pick the server. You can actually pick the model and the product line, oh, and wow. then it will tell you exactly what kind of memory models modules would be compatible with your system. Now, th the reason why I like this is because it's matched, because these companies actually do take care to make sure they're going to recommend a module that will actually work in your system. Very but cool. beyond that, both Crucial and Kingston have really good return policies. So if it doesn't work, send it back. Nice. Yeah. Well, and then one other thing that I noticed, Ryan Shrout, obviously we have a computer hardware specific show on the network, tweeted you earlier, and I checked out PC Per. They have an article where if you wanted to build a rig, you could do so for around $700 and will play Titanfall just fine. So definitely check out their website if you haven't already and you're planning on... Uh, because if you're going to build a rig for any game that's come out recently, this would probably be, be the one. Yeah. Unless you're into Dark Souls, because Dark Souls 2 is coming out soon, and I like that one too. Yeah, I, I didn't really buy into all the Titanfall hype. Uh, yeah. I saw all the commercials, but then we loaded it up that first night, I and I was it. like, wow, okay, this is actually... And crazy. I've had very, like, very yeah. iffy experiences with uh, online-only games, where it's like, oh, the game just launched, but the servers crashed for the first six hours. Yeah. So, yeah. but they were really good about it. Like, game launched at 9, uh, at least on the PC, I think Xbox Xbox had, had a few issues. issues. Yeah. Uh, the PC side, they were running on a native Azure server, which mm -hmm. load balanced really, really well. Right, yeah, I, I noticed... Nothing, like it worked perfectly. Uh, but that is like one of the cons of having an online only game, which a lot of developers seem to be going in that direction for piracy or whatever. So if the servers are down, you're not going to be able to play anything, not even training. But, wop, wop. but wop. so far, it hasn't been a problem. So. Well, you know what else isn't a problem? What's that? Fixing things. Oh, we do need to fix some stuff. We do need to fix things. And, and that's why I'm happy to have on the show. I fix it. Now, you, you've probably heard of this company before. In fact, I'm going to have my esteemed colleague here be the <laughs> hand model for the iFixit toolkit. If you're a hacker, if you're a person who does upgrading of your PC, if you're just the kind of guy who, who likes showing off what you can build, then you're definitely going to want to check out the ProTech toolkit for my fix it. Now, iFixit is the free online repair manual company for everything. Their free step-by-step -step repair guides are foolproof instructions to fix all your stuff. If you shattered your iPhone screen, need to repair your game console, or swap the battery on your Galaxy S3, iFixit has got you covered. They have 10,000 repair guides for everything from electronics like your smartphone, tablet, and game consoles to your home appliances, your clothing, and even your bike. That's right, they, they help you hack the things that aren't technical. They can even hook you up with the most needed parts, the, the things that you need to fix, and everything they sell is tested and guaranteed. If you're ever looking for that dongle, for that s weird piece that you just can't find it, iFixit is the place to go. They also make the most trusted repair tools for the consumer electronics, including this ProTech toolkit that my esteemed co-host is playing with right now. This thing has 70 tools to assist you with any mod, malfunction, or misfortune that comes your way. The toolkit is the gold standard for electronics work from garage hackers to the CIA and FBI. But more importantly, their unique tools are used to repair everything by repair technicians everywhere. Now, this thing includes iFixit's 54-bit driver kit with 54 standard specialty and security bits. They have got Philips bits, Pentalo bits, Torx and Torx security bits, the Tri-Wing bit that uh, a lot of video game consoles work use, and even the Triangle bit that the McDonald's toys use to keep you out from hacking their gear. 
They also have a swivel top precision driver. And one of my personal favorites is this flex extension thing. This, this weird, thank you for destroying my video card, this weird <laughs> rubber looking thing, which allows you to reach into difficult places with your bits and uh, well, work where you can't push the entire driver. They've got an ESD safe precision tweezer for del delicate manipulation and this anti-static strap, which I'm gonna use to, to pull my co-host yeah, um, on camera over here. They've also got nylon spudgers, metal spudgers, and plastic opening tools for prying, scraping, and pretty much doing everything for tablet repair, cleaning heat sink mounts, etc. They're compact, they're lightweight, and they're durable. This whole tool roll makes it an on-the-go choice for repair professionals and amateurs alike. The toolkit is only $69.95 and it's backed by a one-year warranty. Hobbyist and home DIY fixers also use the ProTec toolkit for doorknobs, eyeglasses, cabinet doors, sink fixtures, and so much more. If you're looking for a great addition to any artist or hobbyist toolkit, look no further. Best of all, there are thousands of free iFixit guides to help you put your tools to use. Now, here's what we want you to do. If you're a hacker, if you're a DIYer, if you're a maker, if you're just a geek who likes to fix things himself, why not check out the iFixit toolkit? Right now, you can fix it yourself Visit ifixit.com slash twit for free step-by-step -step guides. iFixit also sells every part and tool that you'll need. Plus, if you enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout, you'll save $10 off of any purchase of $50 or more. That's ifixit.com slash twit and use the code KNOWHOW. And we thank iFixit for their support of KNOWHOW. You done there, uh, Vanna White? Uh, yeah. It is my mic on? I don't hear myself. So, yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, sorry. The, 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 the wonderful thing about this is uh, I, I think we've pretty much used this on every uh, episode of Now How, even well, if you don't Well, I ever. mean, our motto is breaking things so you don't have to. Yeah. And We're good this helps so much at breaking them and then also putting them back together if you have the skill for it. So. Uh, how about that? I leave that to you, though. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Now, Brian, um, I understand that we had a question from the G Plus community that we thought might make for a good segment. That's right. We got a comment from William Burlingame. Uh, he asked on our G Plus page, his February data usage hit 292 gigabytes. His Comcast cap is 300. So the Comcast agent said if he upgraded to the next level, it would bump him to 350. He checked the Comcast site, and it still said he had a 300 gigabyte cap, uh, but his download speed is now 50 megabits. Um, it seems that the only option available is to select markets, and mine is not one of them. Is there a way to monitor the usage and figure out who the main culprit is on the network? Uh, he has a Netflix account for nearly, he's had it for five years, so that's nothing new. Uh, but he, uh, he hasn't come close to the limit before until last month, but he does have a college student living with him now, and he'd like to see what's going on before he makes any act. <laughs> <laughs> before you accuse us, before anybody, accuses yeah. Anybody. Now, this is actually something we get quite a lot. There's people who are saying, "Wait a minute, you know, I've got a cap now, and I don't understand what's eating up my cap." Mm. You know, it, I used up 300 gigabytes last month, and and I know it wasn't me. So who right. was it? Well, there are a few tools on the market right now that can help you figure that out, so you can accuse the right person. So you can go, <laughs> "Hey, you, stop it." Let's but, not start a witch hunt. Let's, yeah, let's not start yeah. a witch hunt. Actually, if if you checked our cap right now, I think at least 50 gigs would be Titanfall. Uh, yeah, sure. 60 right. If we had a cap, If we right? had a cap, if we had a cap. But the cool thing was, this last January at CES, I stopped by the booth of a vendor who offered a product that did exactly this. Just using the router that came with your ISP or a cheapie that you've picked up at the local Best Buys, you're probably not going to get all the services out of it that you need, especially if you're trying to protect children or other people in your household from, let's just say, the darker side of the internet. That's why we've got Skydog. We're here looking at their new product, 149, which will allow you to do essentially deep packet inspection of all the traffic that's going through your network. You want to take a look at how much bandwidth people are using, you can do that. If you want to look at what individual users are doing, you can set policies to make sure that people aren't going to websites that they're not supposed to be at, and they're not using services that they're not supposed to use. The nice thing about this is that Skydog has an enterprise class heritage. They're from Xerox Park. They cut their bones making enterprise solutions, and now they're taking that and giving it you a package that's, well, for the consumer, for the parent, for the person who's concerned about what their loved ones are watching on the internet. If you want a bit more control over the traffic flooding into your house, take a look at Skydog. 
Now, I, I have to admit, I, I took a look at their product at their table because I thought, eh, it looks interesting, but I've seen so many products like this at CES that just failed to impress once mm -hmm. they got into the studio, right? I mean, everyone makes the promise of, this will be the last router you ever buy, and right, then it works right. great for a year, maybe, and, and then not so great, right? It never quite lives up to the hype. But what they wanted to do was they wanted to give a really easy to use interface, specifically mm -hmm. for parents. So people who have a household where they're trying to monitor what's happening on the internet, that is easy to use, easy to set up, and also very easy to set. So you could put limits on what your kids are doing. Makes sense. Now this product right here, we've actually got one of these in, in house, this little unit, the, the SkyDog router. The, the, the cool thing about this is the, the first time I plugged it in and I connected a, uh, a computer to one of the gigabit ports in the back, all it did was it asked me if I wanted to create a new account or associate it with my Google Plus account. So I went ahead and associated it with my Google Plus account and then if you show my screen over here, you're, you're going to see what kind of information you get. Now, I've already done all the setup. I'm going to show you really quickly how that works. But this is the interface that we'd be looking for if we're trying to answer William's question about monitoring usage. Well, that makes it pretty clear about it, what's going on. Incredibly clear, right? So I've got two users here. I've got my use, and then I've mm -hmm. got this, this unassigned. I'm trying to figure out who that is. Right. Cool thing is I can drill down through this. So right now I'm looking at day, but I could also look at hour. I could look at week. I look at month. I could look even further back. So this thing will store all So you all can the, pinpoint you when... Can, exactly, like, exactly. Oh, I know somebody came in to the house on this day, so let's see what it's been like since then. <laughs> right, but, but it's like, for example, so this is the past day that th since I've had this demo unit hooked up in the studio, I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, I want to see everything from that time to about here, because this, this is where I got my main spike before it dropped off. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, it's going to drill in. Oh, come on, come on, drill in. I think I broke it. Well, normally it would drill in and it would allow me to, oh wait, actually, no, I know what happened. It's, it's my mouse. I, I could drill in into individual hours and it would show me exactly what's going on with the users on my network. Now, one of the things I, I really like about this, check, check this out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to users and devices mm -hmm. and I'm gonna assign a new user I'm going to go ahead and call this one Cranky Hippo because I think it was actually, I'm sorry about this, I borrowed your laptop to generate the, the second stream. <laughs> I was wondering where my laptop had gone. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm, yeah, everyone knows your, your email, right? Yep, go for it. Thank you. It's pretty obvious. Yeah, Brian at twit.tv. All right, now when we go back into the setup, it allows me to choose all the options. So I'm going to assign it this this weird computer right here that had that, that red one that I don't yet know uh -huh. who who uh, who was using it. Suddenly there's a 50 gigabyte spike. Exactly. And then I can turn on everything like, all oh, right, what kind of priority do I want to give your traffic? So if this was oh, wow. just someone, a guest in my house, I could turn this all the way down. I could turn it all the way up. I could say he should have max yeah. bandwidth. I could say he should have no bandwidth. Yeah. I can also do things. This is my personal favorite uh, screen. This is the policy. So let's say I know, let's say you're my kid, okay. which is scary in so many different yeah. ways. And I don't want you to have access during the week because you should be working during the week. Now, so all I would do is I would click on no access and I would highlight Monday to Friday the entire days. Oh, uh, okay. And now it knows Nothing. that anything coming from that MAC address, that computer, that device, that tablet, whatever it is, cannot access the internet from uh, from Monday to Friday. But on the we on the weekends, it's it's pur purely open. But Come let's on, say I'm kind of worried father. about. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So oh, I don't want to block you out. So how about this? Why don't I go ahead and give you some standard family permissions uh, between the hours that I think maybe you should be using the internet. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this this really easy to use interface is something that parents could use to say, look. At this point, uh, past 10 o'clock, I don't want you on the internet. You right. should be in bed. You should be sleeping. Now, uh, this is just data, though, right? Is Or can you specify certain websites to block? Or uh, no, like this that, is or? policy. So this is everything. This oh, is wow, everything. Okay. But if I go to next, I can also spe uh, specify <laughs> specific watch lists, specific sites. Oh, and I can tell the router to tell me when those sites are being accessed or when a data cap is being overloaded. Wow, I'm glad my parents didn't have this. Right, I can also enable uh, logging history. Now, okay, this gets into all sorts of privacy issues. I'm not sure if parents <laughs> want to know exactly where their kids have been going. But if you are that kind of a parent, 
This is the kind of tool that will let you do it. Now, okay. something else I want to point out is this is entirely over the web. I'm not accessing the router. Oh. I'm accessing an internet page, which oh, means okay. I could be anywhere in the world, log into that, and change. So you have to be on the land to get to it. Right. right exactly. Oh, okay. But cool. it also means that I have the ability to find out, for, like as William was uh, was want to know, <laughs> who is using up all the bandwidth in my house, and I can go to those spikes and I can say, oh, it was. It was Cranky Hippo. Cranky right. Hippo was the one who was doing it. Or it was Padre. Padre was the one who was doing it. It's an it's incredible tool that that uh, that I, I actually really enjoy. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm looking forward to reviewing this one before you buy. More than that, I'm looking forward to, to finding out all the different features that I can get out of this. Right. Well, this seems like a good tool for someone, especially if they have a data cap. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when my parents wanted me to get off the internet, they just picked up the phone. It's like, damn. <laughs> Wait, dial up. Phone? The phone. You know, actually, a, a there, is a, there is a large part of our audience that, that never had to dial up. You know that, right? <sighs> I don't want to think about that. So yeah. many of our Doom sessions were interrupted from picking up the phone. Exactly. How exactly. Okay, wait. Uh, between the two of you, how many of you have had this conversation? Mom, I'm on the internet! <laughs> I need to use the phone! Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, God. Too many conversations. Bad days. All right, now, now uh, just some of the practicals. This, this router is going to cost you 150 bucks, so it's not crazy cheap, but it's not but expensive. That's not out of the realm of a lot of other routers. So. Right, exactly. And with that 150 bucks, you get the first year of service for free, right? Oh, so, so they start charging They for do that charge service. you. So after oh. the first year, it's either going to cost $30 a year or it's going to cost $60 for three additional years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so right. again, yeah, they're, they're going to charge, but I'm thinking that this is actually one of those things where it's it's worth it. Yeah. If you've ever been worried about your kids accessing the if internet, if you're going over night, your cap, it's going to save you. Or going over your yeah. cap, right? It, that's one month of going over your cap. Yeah. Why not have a device that that you can set limits? You can say, past this point, throttle this user. Right. Or past this point, don't allow Netflix. Or if I'm getting to the close to the cap, don't allow anything but email. Just the stuff I really really need. Right. That that kind of fine tuning of my bandwidth, I, I really like. Yeah, no, this just make I like this product a lot. It just makes me hate data caps, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, is is because we live in a world with data caps. I'm glad this product exists. This uh, Sky Doge. Sky Doge. But <laughs> I don't think they're gonna like me doing that. But oh, it's no, 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 no. But leave it. Leave it. I, don't, I don't really care. But you know, you know what else is good. What's that? You know, I, I, I don't like data, data caps, but I do like learning. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Can you think of any company that maybe we, we have that might help Ooh, us to learn? Something that has well-made videos, that are curated. Uh, Linda? Well, you know what? Why not? I, I think this might be a good time to add Linda to the know-how community. Now, what do you want to learn? You want to learn photography? Ooh. Want to learn audio and video editing? Well, here at Twit, we're switching over to Premiere from Final Cut, so I should probably brush up on that. That's actually a really good thing. Yeah, exactly. We're switching over from Final Cut and a, a Mac-based platform to Premiere and a PC-based platform. Now, the cool thing about Linda is that they are the Premiere online learning company. With easy-to-follow tutorials on lynda.com, you can learn at your own pace, on your own terms, from top industry experts. With a lynda.com subscription, members receive unlimited access to thousands of online video courses that cover a variety of software, creative, and business skills. Now, just like you, I, I like to use the Premiere courses on Lynda because I need to brush up. I mean, I've been using Premiere since I started publishing content, but every once in a while, I, re I realize that my, my knowledge is really limited because there's maybe five or six tools that I use over and over again, but I want to remember how to use all the advanced tools right. that, are, are, that are at my fingertips. I mean, th they're in the software I've already purchased. Why not learn how to use them? Now, Lynda helps you improve your skills, learn new software, and keep up with technology. They have over 2,000 courses with new courses added daily. Instructors are working professionals at the top of their fields and expert teachers who make high-quality video productions from state-of-the-art studios. Now, these aren't those homemade videos that you'll find on YouTube, which, God bless them, are great. They give you a lot We're of knowledge. We're on YouTube. We're on YouTube, <laughs> yeah. right. But, I mean, there are too many out there that don't take audio and video seriously, right? right? The lighting's not quite right, and the mic's not quite right. And I, I don't care how much knowledge you have, if it's painful to watch or listen to, you're just not going to attract that much of an audience. No, and if you're trying to learn something, it's easier to follow along when you have a transcript. Which is what Linda does. They have not just the easiest to follow lessons, but they have transcripts of the content inside the videos. Curated course content, mind you. Each Lynda.com course is carefully structured so that the users can learn from start to finish or jump to a specific chapter for quick answers. 
easy to follow videos that can help you find those answers that you need, and as you mentioned, searchable transcripts that allow you to search inside that video to save time and find exactly what you're looking for. Linda has courses for all experience levels that cover a range of technical skills, creative techniques, business strategies, and so much more. Watch from your computer, your tablet, or mobile device, and then switch back and forth on the chapter where you left off. You can learn at your own pace, at your own schedule, on your own time, anytime you need. Now here's what we want you to do. We know that as members of the know-how community, you want to learn. So learn something new in 2014 with lynda.com. It's only $25 a month for access to the entire lynda.com course library, or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's projects using the exact same assets. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash know-how to access the entire library. That's over 2,000 courses free for seven days. It's all at lynda.com slash know-how. And we thank Linda for their support of know-how. Now, Brian, hmm. Sky, Sky Doge is, is not bad, right? I mean, this is a pretty good service. It, it's, it's worked really, really well. I love yeah. the interface. But I know there are going to be people, be people out there who go, oh. Can I do this for free? Yeah. Is there some tools out there that might help me monitor my... It might not be as elegant. It might not be as well put together. But is there something that I can use? And the answer is, yeah. Yeah, kind of. I mean, okay. you can create tools that will allow you to do essentially what the Sky Doge is letting us do in that, that beautiful interface. Right. It's not going to be as elegant, as you mentioned, but it's probably going to be possible with stuff you have lying around the house. Okay. Okay. Now, the, the first thing that we got to do before we do anything else is we got to know the difference between a hub and a switch. Okay. Is a hub just an extension of like a router and a yeah, switch? Well, yeah, is... kind of. Yeah, well, hubs are, we also call a hub a repeater. Okay. Right? So hub's old technology. This, this is what it looked like. So we, we've got these two scenarios here. This is a hub and this is a switch. Both of them have a frame of information, of Ethernet information, that's coming in on port one. Right. Now, the way that a switch deals with it is when the frame comes in, it's going to read the header. It's going to find out where it's going. It's going to look at its memory and realize the computer that number one wants to send to is on port eight. Right. So it will forward that frame from port one to port eight without touching any of the so other ports. So port one, is that hooked up to the modem? Is that well, no, no. So this would be one computer. This would be another computer. Oh, right? I see. Okay. So that's all it is, right? So this is like every switch that you would buy from a Best Buy or Fry's Electronics or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the idea is switches are far more efficient because oh, okay. it, one frame goes in, one frame goes out. As opposed to old technology, a hub, or what we used to call a repeater. Where one goes in and then it goes out all of them? It's mindless, exactly. <laughs> so computer, the, the computer on port one wants to talk to the computer on port eight. Right. The frame is going to go in. The hub is just going to repeat it out all the other ports. Right, that doesn't seem very efficient. It's not efficient at all, and that's actually the reason why we got rid of it, because you would get what are called collisions. You get computers that are talking at the same time, mm. having to retransmit, and then suddenly your 100 megabits becomes like half a megabit, and oh. not great. Yeah, we, we use switches because they're faster, because they're smarter, and because they're far more efficient. I'm guessing they're more expensive, too. More expensive? Well, actually, that's moot now, because it's almost impossible to buy a, a hub. Hub, okay. There are very few vendors that still sell hubs. But hubs have one huge benefit, and that is the fact that if any traffic goes in, it gets repeated out all ports. If it gets repeated out all ports, we can use that as a device to tap our network. Because oh. if, if in a switch, let's say I've got a computer on port 5 that wants to listen to the traffic. If the traffic comes in on port 1 it's and goes to, to eight, port 8, it's, it's not going to see anything. It's not going to see anything, right? It'll, it'll just be blank. Hmm. But if it's hooked up to a hub, traffic going from port 1 to port 8 will also hit port 5. In fact, any traffic going into the hub will also hit port 5, which right. means if I use a hub, any traffic going into that device can be copied, can be sniffed, can be tapped uh -huh. by my listening device. Okay. What if you put a hub in before it reached the switch? Well, oh, good point, good point. That's what we're going to talk about. Before Sorry. we go there, I thought we want, want to talk a little bit about a tool called Wireshark. I think Alex has the web page for this software. This is sort of the de facto standard for anyone who ever wants to start playing with tapping. Ooh. It's completely free, and it runs on pretty much any computer. Now, the cool thing about Wireshark is it has been developing over the last decade. It has incredibly high-end features 
Not as elegant, not nearly as easy to understand as something like the Sky Doge, but at the same time, it is tremendously powerful. I feel like I've seen it pre-installed on a few Linux distros that I've yep. used. Yep. So it's been out there for a little while. Well, I mean, anyone who's going to be doing any sort of network troubleshooting is probably going to be using Wireshark. Wireshark. Cool. Now, while we set up our little demonstration, I thought we might hearken back to an old episode of know-how. You might remember back in episode 64, mm -hmm. I showed you some basic Wireshark techniques. This is what the interface for Wireshark looks like. If you switch over to my, my PC screen, it's, uh, you know, it, it kind of undecipherable right now. In fact, I'm going to do something that's going to make it even more undecipherable. Okay, I'm liking I, where this is going. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to start my capture. And this is actually running in between PC1. So this is your PC1 that you said you wanted to find out what was PC going on. PC1 is one I'm messing with right, right. now. Right. And, and over to the router. And then right here, I've got my one tap. I'm only looking at the traffic going from the PC out to the router, not the other way. And I'm going to start, if you go back to my interface, I'm going to start my capture. And now this is only the packets that are going from that PC out to the internet. So right now, don't show me, but go ahead and type in a website. Go to a website, any website. Pick a site. Any website. I'm going to pick a site that nobody would ever go to. This is, there's no way on see? earth this is on your machine. And you're starting to see the packets flow. So this is the, the packets that are flowing from his computer out to the router. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put DNS So I'm in the filter box here, which means I'm only wanting to look at packets that have a DNS call in them. And I see here that the very first, I see a Bing call, I see a MySpace call, I see a Google call, I see another MySpace call. So it looks like you're going either to MySpace or Facebook. Oh, here's the weird thing. Notice, what, what, what site did you go to? I went to MySpace.com. You went to MySpace. Notice all those other sites that are popping up. Those are all the other calls that that site is going to make. It calls over to MySpace, but also to Facebook, also to Vinit. Code, no suite, whatever, a couple to Google, a couple to Akamai. That shows you all the different places that your computer's actually accessing when you access a simple website. So that's how Wireshark works. And it's, it's actually really simple. You start the capture, mm -hmm. and then you capture the packets, you stop it, and then you can analyze them. Okay. Right? And oh. if you remember, during that demonstration, I was able to scrape your password. Yeah, I noticed that. Thanks a lot for yeah, that. I'm sorry about uh, that. that was... But also, so it doesn't put it into a nice graphical interface No, it for doesn't. You, huh? you have to know how to use it. But it is free, and it's always going to be free, and you probably can use the equipment that you have at your home. Now, mm -hmm. if, if Alex will go to my product shot, this is, this is what you're going to need. So I've got an old laptop that I'm going to use as my capture computer. So this is the computer that's going to receive all the packets that are running through my network. Okay. Now, I've got my router. So I'm using the SkyDog as the router, so just a standard home router like mm -hmm. you would have, maybe hooked up to your cable modem, your DSL. I've got an old Netgear hub. This is a, an old five-port hub that allows me, again, any traffic that goes in this port is going to be repeated out all of the other ports. Right. And then I've got this switch. Now, what this switch is, this is the thing to which I'm going to connect everything in my network. All, okay. So nothing, nothing connects to anything here except the tapping gear. This is what connects to the rest of my house. Okay. Now, all right. Let me show you on the blackboard how this is going to work. Now, in a standard network, you're probably going to go from your cable or your DSL box wireless and wired, whatever it's going to be, straight to the PCs or straight to your tablets, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to have direct, direct connection. What we're doing is we're putting a device in line. Instead of going straight from your cable DSL router uh, slash modem to the PCs, we're going to go from there to the yeah. hub. We're going to go from the hub to the switch. And then the switch is going to connect to all those devices. Right. OK? So we don't want anything that's not on that side of the hub. Right. And then to this hub, what we're going to do is we're going to attach. Connect your little laptop. Yes. Yeah. Now, this is where my laptop goes that's going to watch all the traffic. Because that hub is going to repeat all the traffic that ever goes through it, mm -hmm. it means that since this is the only way to get to the router, anything that goes to the internet is going to be seen by my tapping computer. So are you going to lose any uh, bandwidth? No, no, no. That's the wonderful thing. This is the reason why we use this switch here, uh, this in the product shot. Uh -huh. we, we use this switch here because we want to maintain full speed in the house. Right. But unless you've got gigabit Ethernet, which I'm pretty sure none of us does yet, you're, you're going to have an internet connection that's slower than 100 megabits per second. And that's oh. the maximum speed of a hub. There are no gigabit hubs. I could live with that. Exactly, right? So as long as you have less than 100 megabits,
megabits coming in or mm -hmm. out from your cable modem, this is not going to be the bottleneck in your network. Okay. But what it will let you do is it will let you capture all that traffic. And like <laughs> William wants to know, who is using up all my <laughs> traffic? If you go and switch to my smaller laptop, the, uh, the demo laptop here, I'm going to show you. This, this is what a Wireshark capture session looks like. There's a lot of data in here. I don't even want to try to scroll through, through uh, everything and explain what it is. Now, you can do a lot of stuff with this data. Like, for example, you could look for passwords. We showed that in the last episode. Right. You could look for DNS queries if you wanted to find out what websites people are going to. Mm -hmm. uh, you could even look for encrypted sites. Oh, and my personal favorite, yeah. This lets you do things like capture telephone conversations. So if anyone ever made an, a voice over IP call <laughs> over your network, you can play back the call. Oh, wow. Which, okay, okay now we're getting into spooky yeah. civil liberty stuff. Let's, <laughs> let's back off for a second. It is your network. This, it is your network. Yeah. But no, no. The part that I want to show you is this. If you go to statistics, mm -hmm. conversations, and you click this, it will start compiling everything. It will start looking at uh, all of the of all the packets. Thank you, thank you, Alex. It will yep, start computing, computing. Yep. and eventually it will give you something that looks like this. Let's go ahead and stop that. I, I pre-compiled uh, this earlier. It's breaking down all of those packets into the devices, the conversations that were happening on the network. And as you can see, there's one conversation here that has a whole lot more data than the others. So okay. what I want to do, I'll break it down by bytes. And this is showing me, oh, okay, this is my top talker. Okay. This right here, this is the IP address and, uh, and, and also the MAC address that is, is stored using in there, most that of is the using data. up all that data. And okay. it will also tell me where it's going to. Ooh. Right. So, so then you can pinpoint the culprit. Exactly. So yeah. if William wanted to say, hey, this was you, he could just yeah. say, he could look at his router table and say, yeah. this MAC address or that IP address belongs to that computer. That's your computer. Stop it. Uh, yeah, now I'm going to limit you. Now, again, uh, just a very small bit of what Wireshark can do, but it, it's pretty incredible considering that this is a free tool. Yeah, totally. Uh, and if you wanted to just learn some stuff about what's going over your network. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, if you want your tapping tool to make those sounds as you're <laughs> calculating, just, yeah, just as contact uh, Alex Gumpel and he'll, uh, he'll set you up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, something I should mention about this is I like this tool, but a lot of people just get freaked out because they're overwhelmed. They're kind of. overwhelmed because there's a lot of information here. It right? looks like it a looks lot like of a lot. gobbledygook. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, look, oh, at this. look at those numbers this. This this makes sense to someone who's been doing a, you know network work for his entire life, but to, to other people looking at this, uh, other than maybe this byte line that, that shows you how much per, how much that one person has been transferring, yeah. this can be a little bit daunting. But so. You know, if I wanted to save the money, I think I'd put the time in to learn how to do it. Exactly. <laughs> and this is what we, we're trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we've given them two different ways to do it. You can either go out and buy an excellent device like the SkyDog, which comes with a service and a graphical user interface, or you could do it yourself, buy a cheap hub, and plug it in, and see what okay. you get. You got options. You, you got, got options, options, folks. Options. How about that? Cool. Oh, what are we going to be doing next week, Brian? Uh, so we'll be doing user feedback from our oh, amazing Google those. Plus community that just reached 6,000, over 6,000. Yeah. So make sure you get in there and put any last minute questions you might have uh, or, or projects that you or want to cover. Or projects you've finished and you want us to show it, we'll Actually, present it on the show. Yeah, let's do that. You know what? We've got a lot of really good questions in there already. Mm -hmm. If you've got a project that you're really proud of, please. Post it in there. Give us a small video. Give us some pictures. Give us a description. We'd love to show off the stuff that you make. Absolutely. And then the next thing we'll be working on is the mobile podcasting thing? Oh, right, right. We're, we're going to update that, right? Because yeah. Ayaz did a uh, segment on creating a mobile uh, podcasting rig. We're going to show you not just how to create an even better podcasting rig, but we're going to show you how to do field audio. Nice. 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 I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Now, we understand that there's a lot of stuff that we covered here. Everything from the parts from the upgrade to the tapping to the sky dog that you, you might need another go around. So here's what we've got. If you go to our show page, you can find our show notes. And uh, Brian, I'd say they're the best in the business, right? Oh, absolutely. As far as show notes go, those are the ones that you'll want to look at. And you can find them at twit.tv slash kh. Yeah, yeah, and also, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm going to put in a little brag here. If you find something in the show notes that you don't like, go ahead and contact us and tell contact us about Padre. it. Contact Padre. No, contact, <laughs> contact Brian 
at knowhow at twit.tv. If you send us an email to knowhow at twit.tv, we will promptly put it into the spam filter. But if you contact us on our G Plus page, we'll probably respond to you. Yeah, well, I appreciate you throwing me under the bus with the uh, congratulations, Google Plus. We hit 6,000 users. If you mail something to us, Brian will send you back a sticker. Yeah, by the way, I'd like, I'd like to apologize for that, uh, folks. <laughs> it's not true. Oh, uh, what you have yeah. to do is send something to the brick house with Brian's name on it. Just put know-how on and, it. Self-address that it. envelope and, and say, send me free stuff. I do have lots of stickers, so if you want to send something to the studio, I'll we'll take care of it. Take we'll care take care of it. it, yeah. Oh, speaking of that, please join our G Plus community. There, again, like you said, there are over 6,000 people in there, and it's always growing. And I, I just love the diversity of topics that people want us to tackle. Uh, and also, I think you can find us on uh, Twitter if you're not much of the, the G plus type. You can find me at Padre SJ. And you can find me at Cranky underscore Hippo. And, and until next time, I think uh, now that you know, go do it. <laughs>